Hi, my name is Kelsey Vivash, and this video is titled Histories of Representation of Gender in the Theatre. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto's Centre for Drama, Theatre and Performance Studies. My research focuses on the history of the connections between bodily fluids and subjectivity, and how this connection is broached in contemporary performance art that involves bodily fluids. I'm fascinated with bodies and how our sense of ourselves is connected to them. Gender and sexuality is a huge part of this, and I'm excited to be here talking about the histories of gender representation in the theatre. The history of representations of gender in the theatre is a huge topic, and it could cover any number of issues and spread in a variety of directions. For example, this topic could be treated as a space in which to discuss the role of women in the history of theatre, a topic that is often underrepresented in theatre syllabi, and that has received far less attention in the study of theatre history than the contributions, writings, performances, and strategies of men. It could also refer to the ways in which gender has been binarized in historical theatre practices, plays, and actor training methods, and could gesture towards the ways in which this binarization can be displaced when we speak and write about these histories ourselves and through our contemporary lens. Or, the topic could dig into this binary, examining the ways in which it has been maintained and or complicated by historical theatre practices such as casting young boys to play women's roles in English theatre pre-1660, or the common trope of the breeches role once women were allowed to perform. With that in mind, and also considering that we understand theatre history to start in ancient Greece, this video seems awfully short. The introduction that I give here will be a truncated one, and it will focus on particular historical moments in which especially interesting or relevant representations of gender took place. I will aim to approach this topic from a broad standpoint, acknowledging that there are a number of different directions this topic could extend in. I'd also like to acknowledge that due to the time constraints of this video, the examples I give below are representative only of Western theatre traditions. I will, however, provide links to information regarding the theatre practices of other cultures in the website attached to this project. If you're interested in this topic and would like to research it in more depth, there are resources available on the website associated with this video. What makes the history of gender representation in theatre such a difficult topic to cover is, in part, the prevailing nature of the erasure of women in historiography. That is, history has, until relatively recently, been predominantly recorded by and about men. Complicating this even further is the fact that historically, gender has been discussed predominantly in binary terms, and so writing a history of non-binary genders in theatre practice is extremely difficult due to the ignorance, erasure, and persecution of these identities by the status quo. Because of this, the history that I examine here will largely adhere to binaristic descriptions of gender in terms of men and women. Thankfully, I will be able to discuss gender in more fluid terms in Gender and Sexuality 2, Gender Minoritization in Contemporary Theatre Practice. The result of all this inequality and misunderstanding is that current understandings of theatre history rely on texts that are exclusionary and that tell only a fraction of the story of theatre's history as it pertains to the populations in any given historical period. For example, they leave out women playwrights whose works may have been performed in private settings in favour of the work of male playwrights whose work was performed in public and was more commercially successful. This means that often, the female characters we study in our theatre history courses are written by men, and that therefore, the historically staged voices of women are not actually women's voices at all. In order to understand how this exclusion emerged, let's start at the beginning, or at least, a beginning. Ancient Greek theatre is an important starting place, not only because it's where we commonly understand theatre to emerge from, but also because ancient Greek plays have had a surprising influence on other theatre histories, including via their appropriation by the Romans, their re-emergence in the neoclassical period, and even their re-performance today. Ancient Greek theatre embodies an interesting contrast when it comes to representations of gender. On the one hand, women are broadly disparaged in important and influential documents, such as Aristotle's Poetics, a collection of his lecture notes that discuss drama and poetry, and that is currently the oldest surviving document pertaining to dramatic theory. In this document, 
and in discussing the four items that Aristotle opines must be paramount in writing a character, he submits that, quote, first and foremost, a character must be good. This rule is relative to each class. Even a woman may be good and even a slave, though the woman may be said to be an inferior being and the slave quite worthless, end quote. And also, quote, the second thing to aim at is propriety. There is a type of manly valor, but valor in a woman or unscrupulous cleverness is inappropriate, end quote. Statements like these set gender up as a strict binary and overtly place women beneath men while covertly solidifying this hierarchy by ascribing traits such as valor and cleverness only to men. Moreover, other germinal documents from this period reflect and reify this view. In politics, Aristotle plainly states, quote, the male is by nature superior and the female inferior, the male ruler and the female subject, end quote. And also in Hippocrates' medical doctrine, which was based on the humors and practiced widely from ancient Greece until the 19th century, women's bodies are theorized as cool, moist, and porous, and therefore less perfect and complete than male bodies. On the other hand, however, there are numerous plays from this period that feature strong female leads and whose popularity endures in today's theaters due, in part, to the robust nature of these women. In Euripides' Iphigenia, for example, after Agamemnon is ordered to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia in order to please the gods and allow his army to sail to Troy, Iphigenia chooses to submit to the sacrifice honorably, effectively placing the good of her family and her country above her own life. Likewise, in Antigone, when Creon, as the king of Thebes, orders that Antigone's brother, Polynices, be left to rot dead in the streets as a traitor, Antigone exemplifies strength and loyalty by ensuring a proper burial for him, despite the risk to her freedom and eventual sacrifice of her life in order to do so. In fact, there has been a relatively recent interest in resurrecting and rewriting Greek plays to reflect the perspectives of female characters whose roles are secondary in their original playtexts. Examples of these include Timberlake Wurtenbacher's The Love of the Nightingale and Margaret Atwood's The Penelope Ad. I will speak about these in detail in Diversities in Gender and Sexuality, too. Even despite the strength of these women, however, it is worthy of note that female characters in Greek plays are often depicted as dependent and or malicious, and that the crisis of absent men is a trope that recurs frequently in plays from this period. To take a step outside of the dramatic text, the representation of historical female playwrights in the canon, and resultantly in academic textbooks and syllabi, is extremely lacking due to a strong bias towards the study of men's contributions to the field. To use a particularly salient example, let's turn for a moment to medieval Germany and the works of Hrosvitha of Gandersheim. Hrosvitha was the first female playwright of whom there is any record. However, until as late as the 1970s and 80s, her works went largely unexamined by theater historians who presumed firstly that her work was a mediocre imitation of the works of Roman playwright Terence, and secondly, that her works were literary in nature and that they were therefore not performed. Sue Ellen Case, however, argues that while the plays were not performed for public audiences, they were likely created for private performance within the monastic community of women that she lived amongst. Moreover, Case notes that Hrasbetha's representation of women was quite astute and radical for her time. While her referent, Terence, represented women as easily manipulable, and with little presence on the stage, Hrosvitha's imagining of his plays gave women significant control within the plot. Another important theatrical role to consider with regards to historical gender representation is the role of the actress. To look at this particular function, let's move now into Elizabethan theater and theater during the English Restoration. During the Elizabethan period, and up until this point in, in the history of the English theater, women were disallowed from performing on the public stage. Historians believe that the exclusion of women from the English stage at this point was due to a tradition of religious attitudes that positioned actresses as no better than whores. Due to these limitations, female roles in plays were performed by young, prepubescent boys in female dress. In terms of this convention, Shakespeare's plays provide us with a particularly interesting historical moment with regards to gender representation. This is due to the prevalence of plays written by Shakespeare 
in which female characters dressed up as men, thus pre presenting audiences with a young boy playing a woman playing a man. Indeed, in contemporary reperformances, the complexity of this gender performance is taken even a step further. Nowadays, these roles would be represented by a female actress playing a young boy playing a woman dressed as a man. While this cross-dressing and its history provides us with an interesting and rich representation of gender to place on our contemporary stages, and while in other types of contemporary performance, it is common for cross-dressing to be used to poke fun at gender stereotyping, as it is in many drag performances, during the Elizabethan period, this convention was often deployed in order to reinforce negative stereotypes about women. To complicate and problematize matters further, Scholars such as Tracy C. Davis have written extensively on the question of whether these roles remain male even when played by women due to their authorship by a male. This convention was led to an end in Restoration England in December of 1661 when women were finally permitted to perform on the stage. Historians believe that this may be due to the return of the monarchy and the nobility from their exile in France and the resultant emergence of French and Italian influences in English theatre practices. In this period, theatre became body. While women were allowed on stage, this provided the means for the proliferation of the breeches role, in which, a, uh, in which a female character would require a male disguise throughout the course of a play. Due to the popularity of large, voluminous skirts at this time period, the exposure of the shape of a woman's legs in men's pants was delivered as a sexual spectacle. Moreover, women who performed on the public stage were still considered akin to prostitutes and were regularly coerced into sexual engagements with wealthy patrons. Additionally, plays in this period often placed the focus heavily on female sexuality. There are a troubling number of plays written between the early and mid-1600s that feature rape as a comedic aspect of plot, including Johnson's Valpone, Decker and Middleton's The Roaring Girl, and perhaps most troublingly of all, Afroben's The Rover, which prevails as one of the very few plays by women that is regularly studied as part of an academic theatre history curriculum. Moving ahead now to the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we are able to see more clearly the ways in which there is a measure of reverse with regards to the relationship between broad socio-cultural conditions of the time period and the theatre being enacted within it. That is, up until this point, the influence of cultural norms on women's role in the theatre has been quite overt, while in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we can more clearly see the mobilization of theatre's influence on the socio-cultural conditions it exists within. The most brazen example of this can be observed in the case of Florence Ziegfeld Jr., a theatre impresario whose Follies shows with their impressive spectacle and casts of impossibly beautiful women shot Ziegfeld to fame by the early 1900s. Ziegfeld was extremely exacting in the casting of women for these reviews, and retooled his selection criteria regularly until, by 1922, his standards for a performer were that her height be 5 feet 5 and a half inches, her weight 125 pounds, and her feet a size 5. As well, to quote Susan Glenn, the height should be about 7 and 1 half times the length of the head, the head should be four times the length of the nose, and when the arms are hanging straight at the sides, they should be three-fifths of the body. Moreover, Ziegfeld assessed that beauty and intelligence were rarely found together, and that in accordance with his stringent prescriptions, only 5% of American women were beautiful. The standards that Ziegfeld set for his performers became the predominant standards of American female beauty, and, in conjunction with the reifications and elaborations of later developments, such as Barbie dolls, Playboy magazine, Disney princesses, and the sexual revolution, these standards are still extremely predominant today. The result of this permeation of Ziegfeld's requirements of women from the theatre world to the general population was, and is, that the representation of women in the theatre became the representation of women out of the theatre too. A history such as this one, rife with inaccurate and problematic representations, as well as exclusion and erasure, leaves us with a number of questions with regards to how we move forward in a positive way. For example, 
how do we stage contemporary adaptations of historical plays without reifying historical biases and prejudices? How do we enact historical biases without reinscribing them? Can we accomplish this? What are the ethical requirements for teaching historical plays that contain representations that we currently understand to be ignorant and regressive? And what are the ethical implications of training our bodies to perform in historical works of drama? <laughs>